uh, three of you hang out with Alex Reed. Uh, we're going to talk about globalization in uh, the industry, uh, industry, some industry, business industry. And uh, so we have some students who are going to ask you questions. But uh, Alex, if you wouldn't mind explaining to my class what your role is. Uh, um, yourself, please. OK, no problem. So as Jamie said, my name is Alex Fries. I um, I'm a product manager for a customization services team, or D2L. So what we do in my team is we try to understand um, different requests that are coming from our clients. So for example, your school, and uh, try to adapt the software to comply with those requests. So basically, we try to make it easier as much as possible and as much as we can do. Um, you know what D2L does. We develop um, educational software or software that allows your course your courses to be online. Uh, so that's what um, my uh, my current job is. I uh, just to give you a quick of a background. I my previous job was in a healthcare company, so it was very similar to D2L, where it was a global company. So we had um, software development sites across the world, uh, and our product was used. Um, many places in the world. So it was, uh, it was a global company. It, uh, so I've been working for global companies all my career, I should say. Excellent. Thank you. OK, Elise, are you please talk really loudly? Okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> My question for you was, how does DTL do, yeah, D2L do their uh, investigations into how implementing technology to learning? How does that help us? Sorry, the, uh, uh, the connection was breaking a little bit. But if I understood your question correctly, you're asking how does D2L do its research into how software is used by educational institutions? Does that summarize what you just said? Uh, yes. Yes? OK. Um, how many of you know software development life cycle? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. So in a, I'll just give you a quick overview. So in a normal um, organization that develops software, uh, and if you've done computer science, or if you've learned a little bit about computers and computer science, there's a, what's called a software development life cycle. And the idea is that you take, you, you from the beginning to the end, you, you cover all the different aspects of the software develop, of software development. So the first piece is um, what we call requirements gathering. It's, uh, so, so you go through requirements gathering, software design, software architecture, then you go through the implementation, you go through testing, you validate, and then you go through that cycle again if there are any problems or no issues or things like that. What um, it, it, that's pretty standard for any software company. I think the, over the past couple of years, uh, things have changed slightly, but mostly to make sure that when you get into the um, implementation side of software development, that you're doing things the right way, and that you're not just adding features or new buttons to uh, an application and hoping that people will use it. So what companies are doing now, and it's all does this quite well is that we have what we call uh, um, UX designers. So these would be user interface designers or someone who gets to go to our clients and ask specific questions about how they use the software, what works, what doesn't. And then they take that information uh, and they work with uh, not only one specific client, but we tend to work with a uh, number of different clients that have different needs, different industries. So for example, um, what we call K-12 or kindergarten to grade 12 would be one specific type of user that we look for. And there's also universities and there's also enterprise or companies. So we tend to work with all these three, trying to figure out what makes sense for all of them. And that's how we develop software. So basically we do our research is we look at 
how people use the software, what they want out of the software, and then we try to develop things that will make sense for most clients, for the most number of clients. So it's, we tend to, to call it the 80-20 rule. So we try to make 80% of our clients happy, 20% might not be happy, and we'll work with them to figure out other ways that we can uh, help them be successful. Does that answer your question? Okay, we're good. Thank you. Um, okay. okay. Oh, big fan of DQL. Um, so, <laughs> so I know that you have like expanded your clientele to like Harvard, you know, world. How did well be so big and so that has gone to Sorry, the I didn't hear anything you just said. <laughs> okay, so I know D2L is um, a very big thing. So like, it has clientele such as Harvard and Yale. So like, how did D2L like became so influential within online education that it has big like clients for you to work with? That's a good question. Thank you. <laughs> it. it um, so I, I think, um, so how, how, how have we become so successful? I think it's, we, we try to understand, we really spend a lot of time trying to understand not only how people use the software, so how Harvard wants to use their software, but also where they want to go. And one of the things that we do really well is we work with them to understand their needs, understand their long-term strategy, and then we show them how our software is going to meet that strategy, how we're going to be with them for the longest time. So many companies that work in this domain of this space, they do, they do almost the same thing. So we develop, you know, we develop software, we put courses online, but a, a company or a, an institution that's so large, such as Harvard, Yale, and there are many others that are similar, um, they, they, they understand what companies can do, but what they're really looking for is, how are you going to help me, not only now, but for the years to come? So I think the key there is we have a very good services organization, an excellent services organization that uh, will support them throughout. So not only um, maintaining your software, making sure it's always running, but also uh, if they need any assistance on creating course courses or if they need assistance on how to integrate with these third-party products and things like that. We're there. We are always with them, regardless of what um, what their needs are we're, we, or what the problems are at that point. We're always with them. So I think that's the key is that you've got a really good services organization that will help your clients, especially the big ones, because you know there are many open source products that out there that people can use. But the service side of things isn't there. So you have to buy this separately, and the cost is different, and it's not global. So for example, even for Harvard, they, they have a, number of, a large number of their students are local in the area, but they also have a lot of online course offerings that can be taken from anywhere. So you need a, a global organization that can help you, that can support you in that, um, to be successful in that area. So I think that's a for us, I think that's the key, is a really good services organization that can help, regardless of what the needs are, they're there to help you. And, and um, so your clients, or Harvard, for example, they know that you uh, were here to support them. So a lot of uh, educators uh, uh, prove that future of educators uh, online videos that they can watch and then uh, uh, that way. Uh, one in particular, the DQ Crave, Sorry, it's really hard to hear you. I, I can't hear can't hear anything. Hey, Jamie, you need to add speakers. Oh. And microphones around your help your room. I have us plugged into our TV, yeah, so. It's, oh, okay. So I'll turn down the volume here. See if that helps. Um, because I can plug the speakers in. See if that'll cut back on some of them. Turn the bass off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah
I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I use a lot of technology, but I'm not a hardware girl, guys. Um, okay, let me see. I have an idea. Does that sound better? Uh, yes, it does. Yeah, it sounds better now. Okay, I'm gonna turn up the volume on my phone. Okay, that's better. Yeah, it sounds better. Hey, uh, so, uh, there's a lot of influx towards uh, online education. Uh, for example, YouTube holds their annual YouTube EDU conference. Uh, and there's one YouTube educator in particular, uh, CGP Gray, who believes that the future of education is within a personalized uh, online feature uh, that can be accessed at any time by anyone. And I was just wondering what you think, uh, where you think the future of education lies? That's a good question. Thank you. Um, so some of these conferences and what we have uh, followed over the past couple of months is um, there's a, a stronger, there are, uh, there are a couple of things that are pushing education. One of them is especially in Canada, we don't see this as much, but in the U.S. and other countries, it's the cost. It's how, do, how can you reduce the cost of education overall? So uh, that's one of the reasons why a lot of institutions are going to online-based um, education so that they can try to minimize some of the costs associated with people or students attending schools and things like that. So you know, if you really think about it, all the, the classrooms uh, and all the material, all the time spent in the classroom, it, it, it does add up quite a bit. So you need to figure out how to get people to use online systems in a better way, but also you can't just take a standard course that you're taking just like this class and put it online and hope for the best. You need to make sure that um, it, it meets the needs of people who are going, going to be using this online. So um, I think uh, over the past couple of months, there are a couple of uh, uh, institutions in the U.S. Uh, that have published some of their findings in um, the best way to use online systems. And I think one of the things that we from a detailed perspective that's pushing for quite a bit, and it's something that we have noticed over the past couple of years, is, um, again, you can't just put a course online and hope that people will go through the material and learn as much as they want. Sometimes, you know, people will go through courses online and they are just cherry picking certain areas that they don't think that they're, they have enough knowledge, and they'll take those pieces and then take the, whatever tests are attached to that course and um, hopefully pass those tests. So one of the things that have been pushed quite a bit is what's called uh, um, competency-based uh, education. And so competency-based education is basically, instead of saying that this test will quiz you on these four things, it is more of a global type of setting that you say, um, I don't know, uh, for example, you know, you have a general idea of what socialization is. And so that is the goal of that course. And if you are able to um, go through that course and just read a couple of different types of material, take the, take the test and pass it, that's enough. You don't have to go and take everything else in that course offering. So that's kind of how, that's optimi optimizing your time. That's optimizing um, the, the, the instructors, the teacher's time and everything else. Right? So that's one way of where education is kind of going. It's, for uh, competency-based education. The other one, too, is uh, the more dynamic way, which is also related to competency-based education, is um, uh, adaptive learning. So you, you kind of mentioned that a little bit more. So it's adaptive learning. So the idea is B2O has a software or a product for that, which allows you to say, you know what? I, am, I see all these different types of online materials that can help me in this particular uh, subject. So for example, biology. So there are all these online um, books or articles or white papers, but I also have all these uh, internal materials such as, uh, you know, essays that people have written before, my, you know, our own private books and things like that, or material that the instructor will offer. And then you can put all this, you can just tell this product, okay, here's all the material. And what it does is it compiles everything into one course, and it says, okay, this is an adaptive course, 
and it is a dynamic course as well. So as you're taking it, so the first thing that happens when you go into that course offering, it says, do you want to take a test? And you say, well, okay, sure, I'll take this test. It asks you some very generic questions. And based on your answers, it will adapt the course um, to your to what your needs are, to what you need to learn. And then you go and you take, you know, you read two or three more documents or uh, you perform two or three more activities. And then it asks you again, okay, let me ask you this again. And it's possibly the same types of questions or maybe more in depth. And then based on your answers, it figures out, okay, does he need to take anything else? Does he need to take a different path? Or you know what, he thought that he knew this, but based on these on his answers, we may have to adapt this. So then it changes the, the it, it changes the content again. Again, so it's basically it's content based, it's um competency based education as well as adaptive learning are things that are gonna drive education quite a bit. Uh, at the end of the day, it's it's trying to uh, there are two things that, that we're trying to do or, or organizations organizations are trying to do. They're trying to meet your needs so that you don't spend more time than you need to in a classroom or in a, in a taking a course. And the other one is reducing costs. Um, education is one of the, in, in, I think in any budget, in any country, is the biggest item in that budget. So they're trying to reduce those costs and improve or making sure that you what you're learning is what you need to learn and not what you have to learn. Does that answer your question? Like, does that make sense? Okay. Sorry, it's a long answer to a short question, but sometimes it's not that easy to answer that question. Okay. So basically, there's a problem with education right now is that there's kind of like a disconnect between the teacher and the student. This is really because, like in high school especially, many of the teachers don't know how to use the software or are not trained to do so. So how does D2L work to like reduce those barriers and kind of like enhance the experience overall? Got it. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, uh, you know, that's a that's a, a, a tough question to answer. So I agree with you. Uh, I think uh, instructors or I think overall, schools. Then you know you want to you need to use technology such as D2L and other software, but you don't always have that knowledge. So D2L itself has what we call. Um, there are a couple of things. There, there's a we have a dedicated team that can help um, organizations create content that's attractive and that is responsive and that makes sense. So we can work with our teams here to create a course from beginning to the end in a way that makes sense. Uh, that team also provides what we call um, game-based learning. So we call it GBL, it's game-based learning. So it's the idea that you can create a, you can create a course that's uh, basically a game, and then based on completing certain steps of that game, you're learning as you're, as you're, doing, as you're going through it. So that's another way of helping um, uh, instructors and administrators to make sure that they create courses that are attractive and easy to use. Um, so there's a, a, an entire team here that is dedicated for this, and then any organization can basically hire that team and, and, and improve that. That that's one way that we, from a service organization, can help uh, organizations um, make their courses attractive and, and make make sense. The other way is um, different part uh, within. Well, we also have uh, something that's called a course builder. It is basically a drag and drop type of um, application that allows you to basically drag and drop, which makes it a lot easier to build those course offerings, right? So those are two ways I can think of. I think we're, we have a number of research projects on how to improve, how to help um, users use the system better, just because, I mean, it's, it's technology, it's developing. Today, what we think makes sense might not make sense tomorrow. So we are always try to evolve, we're always trying to make it easier. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's technology. It's, you always have to be learning. So it is a difficult um, subject to master because um, if you're not willing to learn, then it makes it very difficult for you to adapt to new technologies. Does anybody have any more questions?
in terms of globalization, where do you think technology is? Sorry, can you, uh, can you talk closer to the microphone? I couldn't hear it. In terms of globalization, where do you think technology is heading? OK, I got this. <laughs> and um, So you, you are all familiar with cloud services? Just raise your hands if you are. OK, OK, so uh, I think um, so. I think cloud services is where things are going. Uh, and it's not just because it's the, uh, the latest and greatest uh, buzzword that's out there, but it is again. It's 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 a way to cut costs to minimize um, all the costs associated with maintaining an application, adding new features, getting those features to your users as fast as possible. So I think uh, cloud-based services is, is the way to go. I think something else that's also driving technology and that. Uh, or in a global world is, is um, you know, by having these cloud-based services, it's it's um, adapting those services to uh, the local country. So uh, localization is a big thing is, you know, you've got these services and it's developed somewhere in the world and now it's being used by another part of the world. And how do you make sure that not only is the service available to that um, country or to that area, but also that you have the resources within that country that can, can help people understand it. Uh, I think those are two key things that are driving um, globalization and driving some of the applications around the world. It's, um, it, it is an interesting topic when you're talking about overall globalization because it's so big, right? It's so big and it's um, um, uh, certainly um, uh, it's something that's becoming more and more common, especially with, uh, you know, uh, not only a product that's used around the world, but also a company that develops that product around the world. world. You can, um, anybody in the world can use your software, but how do you make sure that the needs of that region are being met by that software? Uh, you need to ensure that you have people there, you have, to, you have local people that can work with the head office uh, to make sure that those needs are met. Um, I have a number of examples of, um, you know, so for example, I am uh, Brazilian, I, I do help. I do work with our uh, with our office in Brazil to to make sure that we're doing the right things. And you know, the distance is certainly um, um, one of the barriers. But I think it's culture is something that we all we always overlook. Um, we um, we tend to as D two is a global company and its software is cloud-based software, uh, we don't tend to have to, so when, when a client buys our product, we don't tend to send people to that um, to that client to so set up the software and, and uh, go through um, what we call a solution uh, design to make sure that we meet their needs, that we develop, the, we design the software or the deployment in a way that they um, that they want. We don't, we don't send people. Uh, to those places anymore. Everything is global. We do. It's all remote calls. It's all conferences like this. Um, it's all over the phone. And then once we kind of gather all the high-level requirements, we implement it. But um, in places, um, in certain places of the world, that's that's a lot more difficult. Um, I know that, for example, in Brazil, when I started working with a couple of clients there, they weren't crazy about working with me, even though I spoke the language, even though I knew the, the culture. And the reason is, in, in Brazil, the face-to-face -face communication is extremely important. So you can't just expect, uh, if they don't expect that they don't want um, to, to work with someone remotely if they never met that person. So it is very difficult to, uh, to adapt to some, something like this. So that's why you have to have local people. Even though a lot of the work is done over here, you still have to have some people there that will meet with the client, that will try to at least establish or build up that relationship. And once that relationship is built, then you can start adding these remote services to it that, you know, people that can actually work from here to actually get things done. So it is important to, um, to know a little bit about that as well. It's, it's globalization. Um, we, we understand it, we push for it, but you, you, you can't forget that your local needs uh, are very important and you need to meet those needs too. Does that make sense? Very long answer to the short question again. 
But I, so, so for example, um, I'll give you another example. I think I, I was talking to Jamie about this just last week. We, uh, when I started working for D12, I was talking to one of the, the VPs of our side of the organization. And, uh, and he said, um, uh, so he was asking me about some of the needs and uh, some of the culture differences uh, in Brazil. And then he said, I've got a, a really good example for you. And we didn't know how to handle this. We, uh, we, we sold our software. Uh, to uh, to a client in the um, uh, in Middle Eastern country, so you know it could be uh, Iraq, Iran, one of those places, right? And uh, so he said we sent it, we we sold it, and we were very happy. It was a very large account. So uh, as part of what they bought, they bought training, and what they did was because we didn't have a lot of local resources to work with them, we had a small office that's mostly for sales and marketing. So they sent someone from here to work with them there. So basically, they purchased a one week of um, training. So we sent someone from here who um, could move to that country for a week to help the client and explain the different uh, explain the different features, the product, maybe help a little bit with workflow, try to understand what they uh, want to do with and those those kinds of things, right? Well, this person got there, and it was a uh, um, it was a girl. It was actually uh, one of the uh, one of the girls in our team, the documentation team that, or the training team that went there. She got in there and went into the office, and she was barred. She said, "No, you can't come in." And I said, "But why not? I'm here from Fuji Twelve and providing training and all those sorts of things." And said, "I'm sorry, but um, in our culture, we don't take direction or." Uh, Training or anything from 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 females, that's just the way it is, right? So it, it is a, a something that has to be considered in a global um, in a global company that you need to understand the culture. You need to understand the local culture before you make some uh, some of these decisions. Uh, very similar to the one in Brazil, right? Why, as soon as you start adding some remotes to that uh, that engagement or to that interaction, things could become complicated because. You need to understand that you know they need that initial face-to-face -face meeting. They need to know you. They need to meet you, and they need to trust you before they can start, you know, working with you. So things to consider as you go. As you start talking about globalization, uh, you know, the local culture, the uh, global services, and that kind of thing. We have to consider those things. Now I have a question for you. Okay. So when we talk about global global globalization, technology globalization, what are some of the things that you think would be difficult besides what I just talked about? Can you repeat your question for us? Sure. Okay. So. So I talked a little bit about localization, which is very important. How to make your software work for different areas of the world. That's one thing. There's a, you know, one that's very simple that people know is translation. How to translate your software to adapt to that country, to those people. How to make sure that you gather requirements from all different parts of the world. But what are other things that you think uh, when you're stuck, you start talking about globalizing technology, globalizing products. What are some other things that you think might be um, difficult or, or hard to do for, um, you know, anything like that? Does that make sense? It's still pretty difficult. I people uh, on, in other parts of the world because there's different time zones. So, so he's ta I don't know if you can hear him, Alex, but what he's talking about is the time zone difference. Yeah, time zone is a big one. Yeah, time zone is a big one. Okay, good. So, um, Alia suggested that miscommunication, especially if you're translating, somewhere along the way there can be a mistranslation. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay. 
So he was talking about technology literacy as a big one. So with your how you how much confidence you have with the technology. What was the other thing you added? Uh, like, Okay. But he also suggested that <clears throat> motivation between teachers and students, and that if a teacher is unmotivated, then perhaps it's not the best ex learning experience for their students. Am I paraphrasing? Mm -hmm. Other ideas? Okay, so she's talking about the levels of complexity of the software that people are using. Some people might need a more simple program, whereas other people might be looking for more complex tasks or activities or things that it can do. Another idea. Did we miss anything? Did they miss anything? I think they no, there, there, will, there will always be a challenge somewhere. If there's no challenge, uh, we wouldn't have jobs, right? I think that there's always a challenge. But uh, you know, certainly, time zone is, is always has always been a big one. Uh, I remember when I used to work for uh, for the, the healthcare company that we had offices in Belgium. Yeah, uh, we, had, we had offices in Belgium and Austria, which are around the same time zone. But we also had offices in um, China. Which uh, you know the time zones completely different. Not different, but uh, uh, it's a massive. It's almost 12, 13 hour time difference. So you you, you, you kind of have to be creative, right? I, I remember I uh, I managed the China, and I had meetings with them at nine o'clock at night in the summer, and seven o'clock in the morning in the winter, because it was the only time that we could meet. Uh, you know, they, it was one hour, one hour before they started their office hours, or you know, two hours before. I finished my office hours. Uh, so, you know, what, what ended up happening was, um, you know, we would try to get the middle office. So, for example, Belgium, which is only six hours from here, six hours from difference. We would get them to meet with the China, with the China office, get their concerns and uh, updates, and then cor correlate or translate or transform that information back to us, so send that information back to us. So that's one thing for sure. Yeah, the, the levels of technology or knowledge of technology is an interesting topic too because, um, so a very good example is, is uh, India. Um, in, in certain parts of India or um, I would say even South Africa, um, uh, they, the access to uh, the internet, internet access is, is, has been very difficult. So what ended up happening, which is uh, quite interesting, is that for many, many years, it was technology penetration in those countries were very difficult because if you really think about it nowadays, I mean, there are, there's almost no software in the world that won't, uh, that will not, that will be able to, that will not be able to run um, without internet. So what ended up happening was that India, because of the infrastructure, just wasn't there. Uh, or South Africa or, or Middle Africa, the infrastructure just wasn't there. So there were no go-on panels and in, in certain remote areas of the country or anything like that. So what ended up happening is that India ended up leaping um, ahead of us in technology and, and um, uh, uh, technology and, uh, penetration because they completely bypassed the hand-wired line of internet communication. And they went from having nothing to being, to being completely wireless, um, to being completely wireless countries. Everything is wireless because they just didn't have infrastructure. So their internet access is much better than ours uh, from a wireless perspective. They have higher bandwidth and higher speed than North America because they completely bypass that mid uh, the middle um, age, which was everything connected, uh, you've got network cables all over the place, they completely bypass that. So it's an interesting topic because, you know, in some parts of the country, they are more advanced than us because they had difficulties in getting on that um, uh, 
uh, technology uh, way, right? Uh, Australia is another interesting one because it is such a vast country and um, there are very small pockets of population. So very long or very wide areas where um, technology just doesn't exist or technology is very difficult to implement. Very similar to India, but they have a bigger challenge. So for example, when I was working in healthcare and providing software for hospitals, when you try to connect two hospitals uh, that are you know hundreds of miles apart, it was almost impossible. They still have dial-up connection for some of those uh, long-distance uh, connections. So you can just imagine, try to you know, even in the internet world, if you try to play a song nowadays, everything is online. Just try to think of listening to an MP3 file over a dial-up connection nowadays. Right? It's almost impossible, but that's uh, what they still have in some parts of the country. Um, just one more, one more thing, and I think it's uh, something that people don't think about, but I think it's something quite, um, quite big, and it's, a, it's going to be a challenge for all of us, and in education, mainly, or in education, um, the focus being education is uh, uh, cloud-based services. If you, um, where, where do you think, where do you think your data resides nowadays? Like, so let's say. Um, you're, you are using it well. Where do you think your data resides? Where do you think your, the information, your sources, everything resides? So they're saying it's suggesting large server rooms? Yeah. But where, where do you think those servers are? Yeah. In almost every country? Yes. Uh, in yes, maybe. <laughs> Go ahead. So they're saying whole buildings are dedicated to being servers. Yeah, that's true. So, um, so um, specifically to D twelve, and I would say to um, you know to the uh, Ontario uh, regional schools, uh, our data is still in Canada and it's still local. So we do have data centers that are local to our. Um, to our province, so which is very good. Um, but there are data centers that are in the U.S. Uh, we have data centers dedicated uh, to like Australia, those places. They still share data, some data here. But if you live in Australia, your data is probably coming through D12 in North America. Uh, but we do have some data centers there, and slowly getting our systems are being migrated to those areas. But more and more, um, well, uh, Cloud-based services are uh, becoming more global. So, for example, you know, you guys have a slight feeling that some of you use Facebook. Um, some of you use other products that are out there. You know, um, your data resides somewhere. Where it, where is it? Should you, should you be worried about it? It's a, uh, I mean, it's not a big. It's not a. Um, I don't think it's a topic that affects you but i think it's something that we should always be thinking about so for example when um snowden um and uh, wikileaks started leaking data from the cia and from the government and uh, people realized that the u.s different parts or different organizations within the u.s were listening to that uh or were well, listening to that data basically or watching that data uh, some places in the world start to get really worried about it so, for example, I know that um, I was following this quite a bit closely. Brazil was uh, furious about what was happening in the U.S. because they had no idea that Facebook data was actually being stored. Facebook, Facebook, Brazilian data on Facebook was being stored in cloud servers in the U.S. So they started asking uh, some of these um, companies to start moving their data centers or part 
uh, data centers uh, that are going to be storing data for uh, or regional data uh, to be moved to be created in those areas. So that's something to, that, that's something very important. I know that we also here, like this well, we have services that run off uh, AWS, which is Amazon. So Amazon has its own data centers. And uh, some of these products are running off the US, but we're starting to promote them outside of the US as well. But you have to think about where that data is gonna go. So that's another challenge, a global challenge that uh, are bec uh, is becoming more and more, uh, it's coming more to the surface and that people need to be more aware of is where data resides and what happens to that data once it reaches that point. So it's just something to think about when you're talking about, you know, in your class about globalization and technology globalization, think about how global services are affecting um, different parts of the world. I think it's a, it's a very important topic that should be discussed. Uh, something else that um, you, you, I think one of the questions was about what, what are the future challenges of for D2L. Uh, you know, if you think about it, the, the, the products they so if, if, if I have to, if I ask you, what products do you use? And these products you use, you're probably going to say, yeah, you know, they're very easy to use because I use it every day. Um, but then you have to use D12. Do you think it's easy to use? And you're going to say, well, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. So that's another challenge as well is that, is how do we make us, our products easy, as easy to use? to students as it is to, you know, other products that they use every day. So um, that's one challenge that's quite interesting. So for example, how do you, how do we integrate um, technology that you guys use every day into our product to make things easier? Because the more you use a product, the more familiar you are with it. So if we integrate those um, products into D2L, that might make things easier for you to use as well. So just something to think about as well is that you know any global software has to think about how to reuse other technologies, other products, um, and and um, you know D two L is the same. Don't ask a question. Okay, so we have a student question asking. How do you feel about the privacy um, and of the security that of how do you feel about the security of the cloud? That is, uh, that's a very um, wide question. It, okay. It's a very broad question because it, it could be anything, right? Um, I think that every company will focus on what's required for it to meet those. Uh, the privacy laws of um, the countries that its software will be run on. So, for example, D12 focuses quite a bit on user privacy and security, and it makes sure that all its data centers are um, secure. So, we do support a number of standards and guidelines, global guidelines that you know most global organizations have to support. So. I think it, it depends on the product um, that you're using. I think that some products out there are very open and you do, you do have to be aware of uh, how they use your data. I mean, Facebook is uh, Facebook and Google are very, I, I mean, uh, are main examples, right? So once they collect your data, how do you, how do you know or what do you think they're doing with that data? So for example, I was, um, just recently, I bought a pair of sunglasses when I was traveling to the U.S. And I came back and I wanted to know, did I overpay for this or underpay for this? And I did a quick search on Google just to get some comparison prices. And, you know, from what I found, I didn't overpay. So I was probably around, you know, where it should have been. But up to today, every time I go to any web page, an ad come, an ad, a sunglasses ad comes up. So you know that they're using that data and they're sharing that data somehow to other applications. So it's just something to think about. It, it's, uh, I think overall, companies are doing a really good job, but it's very hard because it's a, it's a, it's like a needle that keeps moving. And you think that you meet, you're meeting the needs and that you're, you're, you're secure, but then something else changes and now you have to change. So you have to be aware that it's technology, technology is evolving. Threats are, uh, new threats are, are 
uh, showing up every day. You have to think about that. It's it's, uh, it's a very difficult to do that. But uh, you know, as long as the information is secure and nobody can get access to it, I think that's the thing. Or if you allow it to be shared, then it's only the key information is shared or generic information is shared. So my example, you know, I was looking for these sunglasses and I'm getting ads about sunglasses. Well, that's not a big deal. I know that they shared a search um, a term that I use with other websites. So, you know, it's a, I think most companies are doing a good job, but it's something to be aware of. Okay. Another student question. I wanted to know if you believe that the globalization of technology into classrooms can have a negative effect on the quality of education that a student has. Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, I think there's a. I think there are pros and cons to everything. I think the some of the pros. Um, some of the good things about bringing technology into the classroom is, is that you have, uh, you have access to so much more information. Um, if, you, um, if you have ever heard of, uh, I think it's Ken um, Academy, is that, Jenny? Have you ever used the Ken Academy? Yeah, the Khan Academy? Yeah, Khan Academy. It's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting, though. they're using technology to, um, to share common, you know, to teach people anywhere in the world. I think that's very positive. They're bringing technology to the classroom and then making sure that people have access to more information. I think that's very positive. Um, we are um, some of the new technology with, you know, as I mentioned, game-based learning. I think that's very good too. You know, you're adapting, you're adapting your classroom to help people learn, and it's very difficult to do that just in the classroom. But using technology. Um, it makes it think, it makes it so much easier. So, for example, you know, if someone new comes into a classroom and it's a foreign exchange student that has um, a very limited English knowledge or you know, knowledge of the English language, um, you know, there are uh, you, you know you can introduce a topic and they can even do a little quite a uh, small search in their blog posts to search for that topic in their own language. So I think that's that helps. I think that's very good. Um, I think that the the because the access information it's information from anywhere else. I think some of the negatives is that uh, one thing that we always have to watch for is that we don't we don't lose that that teacher to instructor or sorry teacher to student or student to student interaction. Um, you know, I can see all of you are listening to me, but each of you is busy with your phone or you're searching the internet or doing all those sorts of things, right? So, and that, you know, we are a society that we can multitask, but I think sometimes we undermine um, the uh, the positives of uh, the one-to-one -one interaction. You know, knowledge management, knowledge transfer is, uh, you know, we work best when we collaborate. If we try to do, you know, it's the old saying, two heads uh, are better than one. If two or three people are trying to cooperate on a certain topic, they're going to come up with better ideas and better suggestions and better ways of managing that topic than if you're trying to work by yourself. And you see nowadays a lot of people are just focusing, they're focusing so much on themselves with their devices and they're forgetting about what's happening around them and how uh, how people around them can help them. So I think that's you know that's the negative side of technology coming into classrooms, uh, but I think there are pros and cons to that. All right. Well, um, thanks, Alex. We really appreciate you joining us and doing all your business with us. No problem. It's wonderful. Um, it's really great to hear uh, from somebody who works in the business field and other in talking about all of the great things that can happen and how you guys integrate the innovation to make life better. So great to hear for us to hear. No problem. I, I caught some of the stuff that you just talked about, but I know it's positive. <laughs> it was positive. <laughs> um, uh, just um, uh, I just have one. Uh, one uh, if I have five minutes, no, not even five minutes. So I'll try to do this in two minutes. One of the questions that uh, 
was asked is um, and it's a um, um, Jamie shared me some of the kind of shared some of the questions with me is has your career ever changed because of uh, technology or um, you know has have my morals ever changed because of the technology of the field that I'm in. Um, I, I don't. Uh, I think it's a tough question to answer. I think it's uh, some things will change. I think, for example, I've always promoted technology as the one thing that can solve almost everything. I think I, I truly believe technology. I've, I've been in technology since I was, you know, 16, 17. I've always liked computers. I've always liked, uh, you know, to be the early adopter on almost everything. And, and I still believe that. And I think that. Um, it, it changes you. I think uh, the more you use technology, it, it, you know, it's, it's uh, something, uh, it's an old saying that we always said in computer science, right? It's garbage in, garbage out. If, if bad information is coming in, bad information is going to come out of what you're trying to do. So you need to learn how to use that properly. You need to learn how to put the information properly. And um, I think how, how this has changed me a little bit is, you know, working in healthcare, uh, you know, no, what we were doing, creating software for hospitals, will affect, will have a tremendous impact in the patient that's on the table or in a procedure. So that kind of changed how I, I saw certain things, how I saw technology being used. So that's something to think about as well. It is the same thing. I came in, um, it's, a, it's an educational software and it's being used by people like you and now you know my own daughter who's four years old is starting to use uh, she's you know in gk and she's starting to use her software and i'm just thinking well that a good thing uh, it's good that she's using it but uh, again you know the instructor uh, might not um have the best knowledge on how to set up that course properly so that she can have a really good experience in it so it has changed a little bit. I took a look at things a little bit more in detail and before I, I make any uh, just, uh, drastic adjustment or, or judgment. So uh, I think it's changed me a little bit, but I think for the best. I'm just more careful. So I think that was one question that I wanted to answer. I think it's important. I'm done, but thanks for inviting me. It was, uh, it was very nice to, to be able to attend this meeting and, and try to share some of the things that I know. Uh, if you do have, if there is any question that I didn't answer that you still think that you should, just give it to Jamie and then she can share that with me and I can, uh, I can see an update uh, the next few weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. See you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.